Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Today, I have Jessica Green on the show, and I love hearing stories about how people got away from the entanglement of, of government or statism and how they got into anarchism. And you're going to notice a common trend when you hear these stories that the majority of these people came from some sort of conservative background. But Jessica comes from the opposite end of the spectrum where she was involved with the pro- progressive left. And I find this fascinating because she's the first person I've talked to that's came from that side. And I'm going to let her tell us her story. It's a it's a great story. Let's go. Yeah. Left, right, left, right, left. We got our marching right, orders, man. Left, right, left, right. We'd rather left, serve God than right, serve Caesar. You feel me? Right. I'm just trying to live. So do you want to give us a little background of yourself and kind of go into how you got involved with the progressive movement? And we'll just kind of go from there. Um, so to give you kind of a perspective of how fast this kind of went for me, I was a Bernie Sanders voter in the primary of 2016. And pretty much through the entirety of the early 2010s, all the way up until that time, I was very involved and vocal on the Internet about progressive leftism. And a lot of that had to do with being involved with internet atheism groups on places like Facebook. I actually ended up being an administrator for sort of a a chat group on Facebook. I I don't want to name the group publicly because it ends up causing me a lot of problems when I do. But they had somewhere upwards of, you know, 145, 150,000 members in their heyday. Wow. Yeah, it was a huge group. And so um, part of being involved with sort of like Internet atheism at that time also meant that you were kind of involved in progressive leftism. Like you'll find conservatives who are atheists, but they're kind of few and far between. Whereas if you're, you know, an atheist on the Internet in the early 2010s, it's likely you're also being inundated with a lot of like leftist ideology. And that's what happened to me. I bought into all of that hook, line and sinker, the sort of the atheism and the leftist progressivism were, I I like to say they are two sharks that swim in the same waters. So they're not exactly the same thing, but they're very involved with each other. So I was, you know, very vocal. I kind of like attained position within my little echo circle, echo chamber. And um, I was, you know, just as participant as everybody else in that group in the sort of cancel culture and forwarding that ideology to the point where I was taking it offline. I was behaving that way with like my friends and my family. And there are friends that I was, you know, friends with for all of my life who I no longer talk to because of how intensely strong I became in the way I was voicing these opinions. And I I, I don't blame those people at all. Um, You know, anybody who's interacted with a progressive on the internet, like on Twitter, Facebook, anything like that, you know that it gets ugly and it gets ugly fast. So after the election of Donald Trump, which I suffered all of the exact same level of Trump derangement syndrome. And I watched the whole Charlottesville riots on CNN for 12 hours in sheer terror, clinging to my pillow, like, oh my gosh, what's happening to the world? And there was a moment, and I think it was 2017, uh, Senator Rand Paul was actually attacked by his neighbor. And it was a really violent attack. It wasn't just like two old men fighting in the yard. It, it was like this dude put him in the hospital and he had broken ribs. He had to have surgery. On, I like he had a punctured lung. It was awful what had happened. And like any like normal human being with their empathy intact, I was saying this is awful. Like it's it was a political attack. So being a person who was on the left, I was denouncing it, saying, hey, you know, this is coming from my side and I need to denounce it. I need to say that political violence is not OK. Well, I had no idea, apparently, the kind of seismic shift that leftism really had taken, especially after the election of Donald Trump. And 
my people, people I had been friends with and like, uh, you know, activists with for years, they rolled on me in the splittest of seconds. And I became the enemy of a group of like <laughs> very forceful people. And I had had position within that group. And it happened overnight that I started getting all these like really horrible personal messages. I would have like weird type internet attacks happen to me. Um, sometimes they still do. It's abated now that a lot of the people have kind of like gone on to other targets. But I realized what it was like to be on the receiving end of some of this insanity. And I'd like to say, okay, I had all this integrity and I, I realized that I shouldn't be doing this to people, but that didn't happen. What happened was I disagreed with them once and they turned on me. And that experience, that kind of it was a wake up call for me. And I said, gosh, this is how I've been treating other people. <laughs> this is how I've been treating my friends and family. It's awful, you know, and I was politically homeless for a little while. I kind of, I still considered myself sort of nominally leftist or nominally Democrat, but I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm put, putting down all these SJW tendencies. I'm, you know, backing off of all of this. And a friend of mine had actually suggested that I listen to the Tom Woods show. And I had never heard of him, of course. Before, if someone had told me, listen to this show, I would have Googled him. I would have seen, oh, the people who put out the opinions that I'm supposed to follow have said, don't listen to this guy. So I'm not gonna. But it was just like a really unique moment. This thing had just happened to me. And I was maybe op open to listening to ideas that I wasn't allowed to. So I listened for a while and um, some of the things he was saying was, ma was making sense to me and the way that leftism was being described. I was like, yeah, I've experienced that firsthand. I know what you're talking about. And took some book suggestions, started listening to podcasts. And honestly, like the podcast world kind of like broke everything open for me. And I was like, so many people have actually gone through what I've gone through that you know, they realized that the left has kind of lifted up its skirts and ran so far in the other direction that all of a sudden, you know, you're you're also I've been called alt right. <laughs> I've been called a white supremacy sympathizer. And it was like, wow, you know, two years ago, I was just a just a regular Democrat. So um, I I really started to realize some of the ways that it's like an insidious ideology and the reading of the books. Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, and The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose. Also a good healthy dose of some Jordan Peterson. I needed to make my bed <laughs> and I got turned on to that guy and I was like, okay, there's some really, really good stuff here. I kind of was able to listen to people who had better interests at heart and it turned my life around. Like my, my life got significantly better as a result of these changes that I was making. Let me ask you something real quick. Have you noticed since you've you've gotten away from all of that? Because it, it, it happened to me that I'm a whole lot happier than I was, you know, when I was entangled with with uh, politics and government. You know, the, all the fighting and stuff. It just got really ugly, and I I, I feel like I'm a whole lot happier. And I, I mentioned that to somebody at work the other day, and he goes, "I don't know, man. You seem like you get a little worked up." I said, "No, that's not anger. That's frustration. I mean, because there's so." there's so many people still involved with it. And it just, it frustrates me because if you just take a second and open your eyes to what's going on, whether you're a conservative or a liberal or, or whatever, if you just take a second and open your eyes to the truth or to what's going on, man, you, it'll blow your mind and you can get away from all that. I think it comes down to the fact that you're still who you are. So even if you kind of like get away from a bad ideology, you still have that passion, the, pa the passion that you had that made you want the world to be a better place. That's still there. It's still intact. Um, it was just misguided for a while. At least that's the way I see it for myself. Like I still care about the world. I still care about poor people. I care about, you know, the environment. I care about those things still. I just have a more mature and well-rounded understanding than I was able to have when I was a political partisan. And the thing about partisans is you're not allowed to listen to thinking that goes outside of the allowed set. Tom Woods calls it the three by five card of allowable opinion. And boy, is that the best analogy I've ever heard for it. Because if you set one little foot outside that border, 
they'll roll on you. Yeah, I noticed that when I broke away from uh, the, the Republican Party, you know, because I was, mm-hmm. you know, if you if you go vote Libertarian or you vote for third party, you know, you're actually voting for Hillary Clinton. And I was like, I said, that doesn't even make sense, man. Yeah. I said, because my vote tally is going to the guy that I'm voting for. I'm not I'm not voting for yeah. Hillary Clinton. I mean, you know, and I went extreme third party. I ended up voting for uh, Daryl Castle in 2016. I knew he didn't have a chance, but, you know, in my mind, I could not bring myself to vote for Donald Trump. That's when I started waking up to what was going on, because that was just I couldn't for the life of me understand how so many people were getting behind him. You know, the way he was acting, you know, it's it was he. And I say I said this in some other episodes, too, and I have no reservations about saying it. Donald Trump is a scumbag. He's not a good human being. And I, and so many people, they just turn a blind mm-hmm, eye to it because mm-hmm. he's got a letter by his name. There's a lot of that on sort of both sides of the aisle, because you would hear that exact same thing during the election, that if you don't vote for Hillary, you are effectively voting for Donald Trump. And to me, I chose to actually not vote in the 2016 election. I was a Bernie supporter, like I said. And so when the DNC did Bernie like they did, I was like, well, I'm not going to vote for uh, you know, Hillary Clinton, she's a corporatist. That's exactly the, cause I was a socialist at this point. I was like, I'm not going to vote for this corporatist, you know? And it, it was my deep shame that I hadn't gone out and pulled that lever, but now I'm glad that I didn't. Cause I get to hold my head up high at least and say, you know what? I didn't pull that lever. They weren't able to convince me that I owe my agency as a voter to them. And I'm going to forever feel good about that at the very least. Well, that's good. I mean, you've got some you've got some principles <laughs> behind you that you stand by. That's uh, I'm learning how to have some, we'll say. <laughs> yeah, it comes in small doses for me. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I can still walk out and be hateful, but I try not to be as, as much as possible. You know, and I think being involved with all that stuff makes people hateful. It gets pretty ugly watching liberals and, and conservatives go back and forth with each other. You know, the government has done a fantastic job of polarizing everybody and they've, they feed off of fear, you know, and the more people that are, that are afraid, the bigger government gets. And it's just turned into a, a monster, you know, and now as an anarchist, I can look at it and be like, you know, I'm done with, I can't be a part of this anymore. I'm, I'm tired of everybody being ugly. Yeah, it wears on your heart too. And you're. What's exhausting? Yes. That's the perfect way to describe it. Like, you have to devote so much energy to hating other people. And, you know, especially, I think, coming at it from a real, like, a Christian or religious perspective, it's like you're not, you know, you're not supposed to bear this anger toward people. You're supposed to forgive them. And, you know, that hopefully is part of what informed some of why I was like, I have to listen to people who don't agree with me. And even though, it's not easy. Like a, a human psyche is not built to absorb ideas that it doesn't want to hear. Like we're really good at sort of convincing ourselves why to dismiss others' ideas. And you have to work against your own nature in a way to say, okay, I'm going to purposefully listen to something outside of my my wheelhouse, outside of my territory, and see if I can gain something from that. And a lot of times you find out that people don't agree with disagree with you on all that much. You agree on almost everything. It's just this little tiny window of stuff that you don't agree on. I think you mentioned that. And I think and I didn't mention this at the beginning of the show, but you you have your own podcast as well. And the way I found it, as you posted a picture of your setup on Facebook and I, I, I was like, that's cool. So I asked you with the name of it and I wouldn't listen to it. And I think it was your third episode where you're talking about, you're telling your story. And I think I've listened to that episode four times. I find it completely, oh, wow. <laughs> completely <laughs> fascinating. I can't tell you. I mean, it's been a lot of fun to listen to and yeah, I'm enjoying your podcast so far as well. Thank you. That's, that's really amazing. I'm, I'm glad that my story could resonate with you. I was really nervous kind of putting it out there. Um, there are parts of my mind that sort of still feel like I'm betraying something and um, to know that it affects people is actually really heartening. I really, really appreciate that. Well, it's just it's just encouraging to me to, to hear your story because it's like had me and you talked back in 2012 or something, man, we probably would have been seething at each other. Absolutely. That's one thing that I'm, I'm trying to get away from. You know, with this doing this podcast, it kind of gives me an, an outlet. So I'm 
can leave people alone, you know, and they can choose to listen to it or not. <laughs> I completely relate to that. It just absolutely it's, it, it helps me relieve my frustration a little bit, you know. And you said something about being politically homeless. Whenever I started switching towards anarchism and I was studying it and trying to learn more about it, I was watched how it was, would align with my faith. I was like, man, there's more of us out here, and I thought it's a. I know we're a, a huge minority, but it's it's fun to know that you've got somebody you can talk to about this. I was in the Lip, Mises Caucus Libertarian group, and I saw Stephen Rose making a comment in there, and I was like, it just resonated with me. I was like, wow. And this is still at the point where I considered myself an atheist, and I was I just like talked to him for a little bit, and he's like, hey, we got this group, and. I don't know. It just kind of like I was like, hey, I'm an atheist. Is it OK? If I, I mean, like, you know, I'm not I'm not the kind of person that's like aggressive or mean. I, I I went through a lot to get away from that. So I was like, hey, I'm not a I'm not a douche, you know, <laughs> uh, but can I come listen to people in your group talk? Because I think these ideas are really interesting. And, and he was like, yeah, definitely. Come on in. It doesn't matter that you're an atheist. Yeah, I love Stephen. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. The the changes my life would go through. And that was maybe a year, a little over a year ago that that happened. That's interesting. I was curious how you got involved with that group as well. Cause I remember seeing you and some of your comments in there and the stuff when you started studying the Bible a little bit. And uh, it's been, it's been heartening to watch actually. Yeah. The uncanny thing about the Bible, I'm a person who history is like my hobby. I'm, I'm not like a professional historian, but I, bathe in history. And so I, I have always believed, even when I was an atheist, that the knowing and reading the Bible is part of being a good historian and knowing history. And I've read it before, but my reading of it now, it's as though it had been written in a foreign language. And then all of a sudden I'm able to speak that language. And it's not about being like the old English version or anything like that. It's like, being able to understand the message. It wasn't accessible before. Like I read the words, I understood their context in the people's lives of the time, but reading it now, it's applicable to me. And that's a change. That's as though somebody has taken the, you know, do you remember those things when we were kids and it was like a, um, it would be like a secret code and you got the red sheet, the red see-through and you would put it on there and you'd be able to see the secret code in there. Right, yeah, yeah. It was like it's like that. It's like somebody has given me the red sheet, and I can re I can read it now. That's and, awesome. Yeah, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It's been a ride, <laughs> and I'm only through three of the books, so I have a whole lot of Bible still to read. That's fun. I and mean, it's a lot of fun. I I wanted to ask you something too, because when I was listening to your episode, you were talking about you know when Bush got elected and you were a kid when Clinton was president and you thought everything was great. And then Bush got elected and you thought everything was going to go bad. And then you were so happy when Obama got elected. And at what point during his presidency did you start becoming, I think you said you became disillusioned with the democratic party at that point. And so what was it about Obama, what he was doing that made you disillusioned with them? Yeah, that's a great question. I have always been anti-war. That's something that has been part of my makeup since I was little. And although I was happy when Obama was elected because I thought he had made a lot of promises in the way of closing down Guantanamo Bay and, you know, ending these war these Bush wars and all those things. And during the during the Bush years, it was very popular to be anti-war. Everybody was anti-war. And then Obama was elected right. and everybody suddenly forgot that the war not only was still going on, but was escalating and becoming so much bigger and so much deadlier and so much more costly. And, and then the drone pro program, you know, the, um, the WikiLeaks exposure. So th there's a combination of things that sort of happened. It wasn't just the one event. It was watching, thinking, OK, well, he's going to close Guantanamo Bay. And when that doesn't materialize. You find out that. All, all of the things that Bush was doing that was horrible and evil, none of that stopped under Obama. There's a drone program. This wedding got bombed. This bus got blown up, had a bunch of kids in it. And it was just horrifying. It was horrifying to watch. And you are also existing in a world where as a progressive, you're not really allowed to um, lay any of this at the feet of the commander in chief. None of this was Obama's fault in my mind. He wanted to do the right thing. He just, you know, couldn't or whatever. 
And so I would I would often attribute it to this general, that general, the State Department, whatever, without ever like really being mentally honest about the fact that Obama was the one implementing these programs. And so Obama kind of escaped my blame pretty much up until like I became an anarchist and I started realizing like like being mentally honest with myself about it and saying, okay, this is the guy who was in charge. He was doing it. But I was plenty disillusioned with like the government itself. By the time Bernie Sanders came along, he sort of presented the the same thing Trump presented to people, I think, which is the anti-establishment candidate or somebody who was going to go in there and shake things up. And I think a lot of people who voted for Trump, just like people who voted for Bernie, recognized that the government was messed up and corrupt and and needed to be shaken up. And I I heard a correspondent on CNN once say that the election of Trump was like rolling a stick of dynamite into Washington. And I was like, yeah, that was the will of the people, though. (laughs) Like, that's what we wanted. And everyone, even the statists at their heart were like, okay, we believe in the state. We believe we're part of the state. But obviously, this one needs fixing. So you know, the left didn't get its way on that one. <laughs> they uh, they uh, ended up trying to go with a safe corporatist candidate, such as Hillary Clinton, and they lost badly for their bad decision. Uh, had Bernie been the contender against Trump in 2016, he might have won. I mean, I might have, you know, I stayed out of the election because of what had happened with the DNC, but I might not have had it been Bernie. I might not have gone through any of this. So, you know. That's pretty cool, too, because I tell people this all the time, because had it not been for, you know, the election of Trump, I would probably probably still be or just the nomination of Trump in general. I would probably still be voting for Republicans. So I do have something to be thankful for about Donald Trump. It got me out of all that garbage, you know, and it's when you met, you talked about, you know, they they wanted an anti-establishment guy in there and that's why he got got elected. It turns out he's not any different than the rest of them. Maybe a little, but once you're in there, he's he's part of part of all that. The wars under him are escalating. They talk about that peace deal that they're talking about with Afghanistan or the Taliban. I I have I'm very skeptical of that. I just, it seems like there's too many loose ends that it could just be ended quickly. And I think not long after that was they went and bombed some Taliban. <laughs> so I, I just don't believe them when they talk about ending any of that. I think there's too much money to be made for them to in these wars. Well, they've also like absolutely ruined the infrastructure of most of these countries so that, you know, it would be virtually impossible for some kind of non, how to say this, I'm trying to think of a good way to say this. Uh, You know, there, there are um, wealthy interests all over the globe. Once we pull out of that situation, another interest with the funding to take over dealing these people a death blow will do so, in my opinion. I don't think these people are going to see any kind of like establishment of a a stable government for themselves or democracy or any of those types of things, which would give them some stability. Even if as an anarchist, I don't find that ideal. I do not want them to be under an occupying force. I don't want them to be in the chaos of war. And they're not going to be self-ruled. They're going to be ruled by whoever pays for the next person to rule them. And that's that's the fault of the United States government. They have taken the the agency of those people and... um, you know, destroyed it physically with bombs. So you, you also said in your episode, and I found this interesting, you were talking about Rand Paul while ago and getting attacked. You said you didn't have a Ron Paul moment, but you had a Rand Paul moment, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, when, Ron, when Ron Paul was uh, trying to run for the nomination for the Republican Party, I, I remember at that time I was watching him on stage and he was talking about basically you, you want to know why these people are mad at us all the time. It's because we're occupying their countries. We are we're bombing them. I, we would be furious if that was happening over here. Everybody would be ready to go to war, you know. And so, but I was one of the guys that was booing him off the stage. You know, I was like, this guy's unpatriotic. He doesn't support our military. How could he even be trying to run for the Republican nomination? He's not a Republican. Turns out he was he was right. I mean, I have a hard time trying to convey that to other people because. They don't see it that way. You know, we, we have to support the military. And I was telling uh, Abby this when we recorded our episode. I, I support our troops so much that I want them home with their families. 
I don't want them coming back maimed or broken or in a casket. You know, I want them home. They need to be home with their families. We have no use to be, we have, there's no reason to be over there. And, you know, I was when Bush, when 9-11 happened, Bush was, I was beating the war drums. I was like, we've got to go get them back. It, you know, and I, do, we don't even know who we're fighting anymore. If you look at the, the terrorists on 9-11, the majority of them came Saudi Arabia. We give Saudi Arabia money and weapons. How can you make that make sense in your head? You know, and we're over there bombing Yemen, you know, or, or Syria. <laughs> Why? And I think, I think they know that it doesn't make sense and that people are so politically team sports oriented that it, it doesn't have to. Well, we talk about that a lot on this show, too, is it's tribalism. Exact, that's the exact word. Yes, thank you. Tribalism, that it's not necessarily about believing the story that the Pentagon is trying to feed you. It's about believing that you're on the right side. And everybody believes he's on the right side. Even the terrorists believe that they're doing the right thing. Nobody's, no, I don't think that almost anybody, I mean, there are people with like, messed up brains who do wrong things on purpose. But for the most part, people are convinced that they're doing the right thing, even when they're clearly not. And that's why it's very interesting to me that all of these people are sort of having their faith in the institutions of the state shaken. And it's causing them to either go the way that we've gone and, you know, learn about maybe like libertarian types of thinking, um, anti-state types of thinking, or they really double down into their, their statism and they dig in and they dig in because they've wrapped up their personal sense of worth and being and all of that stuff into the state. I have people, when I talk to my friends who are status, the, the phrase that gets repeated over and over and over again, and you may have heard it too, is that we are the state and the state is us. And it's not just when people say that they think they're part of the state. It's they think they're, you know, their parents and their culture and all of the things that make up who they are as like an essential being are part of the state. And so when you try to come along or not you specifically, but any of us try to come along and say, hey, you know, you, sh you should be ruling yourself. You shouldn't be ruled by other people. That doesn't resonate with them because they think we're all ruling together no one's ruling anyone else we're just all ruling together which is garbage i mean it's garbage yeah i agree <laughs> what you're essentially doing when you're voting is you're, you're forcing your will on somebody else that doesn't agree with you and so you're ruling other people by doing that and you're not i hear people say well we are the government just like you were just talking about and that's not true when they get elected they don't have any they don't have any interest in serving the people like they're supposed to or was set up to do. I'm very suspicious of anybody that is seeking political office. I mentioned this in a prior episode that before I'd moved to Memphis, I was very close to running for state house in, in Arkansas. I mean, we were I was in serious talks with the Republican Party and I had some backing and then I got a job offer in Memphis and I'm, I'm thankful for that. You know, it got me away from that. But I think at the time, my idea was, I'm going to go in and I'm going to follow the Constitution and we're going to promote liberty. This is what this is the whole point. We're going to promote liberty. But I, I'm afraid that had I got entangled with that, my views would have changed at some point. You start compromising. And then when you start compromising, you're compromising other people's liberties. Absolutely. The idea that one human can sort of represent, you know, 350 million. I don't know how many people there are in this country. 300. 25 odd million people. And it doesn't matter how you parse that down. It's like the individual represents themselves and you can't collect, you can't collect will into a single person. It just doesn't work that that person will forever have their own interests. They'll have their own sense of self-preservation. And when people get into office, you know, power is addicting. It corrupts. That's why we have that phrase, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. The nature of trying to rule another human being in and of itself is evil. So once you've availed yourself of that, you're going to be, you're going to have your heart corrupted by it. That is my belief anyway. So a person might have um, valiant interest. A person might think, I'm going to get in there. I'm going to change things. I'm going to do things for the good. And I think a lot of people like with the military too, I think they get involved with being in the military for the same reasons. They think they're going to go do some good. 
And the human psyche needs to sort of double down on that philosophy or realize that they've participated in something evil. And the second thing is much, much harder to do than the first thing. And almost every human person I know, it's, it's the easier path. You know, I've got uh, I've got friends and family that are that are in the military or, or ex military, and I know these people personally, and I, I know that they are good people. So I know they had good intentions going in, but like you said, it's what's happening after that because some of them are broken away, like as far as vets that have served, and they they see it for what it is. It's it's gross, you know. The, you're, you're going and killing another human being. And I heard something on another podcast that is a free man beyond the wall. I don't know if you've ever listened to it, but I never miss an episode of Pete's show. Oh, I love it! It's a great show. He's a. I, I actually listened to him more than I think anybody. But he had three guys on, so you've probably heard the episode. And they were all Christians, and they'd served. And one of them made the point. He said, "What you don't, what you're not thinking about, is that you're actually." You're killing God's creation. You know, mm-hmm. God created that person as well, just like he created you. You know, yep. God's not just hanging out in America. <laughs> as, as much as people want to think we're a Christian nation, we're not a Christian nation. Do you know how big of a pill it has to be to swallow the idea that God loves your enemies too? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. That's a huge pill. There's no wishy washiness Yes, yes. And he loves them as deeply as he loves you. And it's beyond measure. So they talk about that in scripture that, you know, anyone, anyone who should do harm to another is doing harm to me. Right. And when you were talking about in, in, the individual, that's what attracted me to anarchism so mm-hmm. much was it's, it revolves around the individual, you know, and I love individualism. I wish we could all just get to that and get away from tribalism. I think that there are um, cycles in humanity where we can sort of like build our cities and we build up our collective efforts and then those inevitably fall down. And we have periods of, you know, fr- relative freedom, but relative freedom also comes at the expense of a lot of things that we come to appreciate by living in a, li- I hate the phrase, but living in a society. You know, when we build our cities and have our roads and all these things, life becomes very convenient. It becomes easier and we're able to do more. We have people who can write symphonies and send ships into space and all of these things. Um, what nobody, wants to admit about freedom is that it involves um, a significant amount of self-responsibility. And you can no longer rely on this idea of the the grand civilization keeping you together. Well, I think absolute freedom scares the crap out of people. You know, I think it's... Absolutely. And I think that comes from, you know, feeding off of government. I think they perpetuate that fear and, you know, they do, they don't, they don't have any interest in, in keeping you free. That's not what they're in there for. And so I think, Absolute freedom scares the crap out of people. And that's why they tell you like, oh, if you homeschool your kids, they'll be weird. They'll be antisocial. Like the idea that you could take on a responsibility that we as a society have given to the state is like insane. It, it People are like, well, what are you crazy? The, the state educates your children. We've been doing right. it for so long now that what, what used to be the standard that the, the parents you know, the community, the parents, the church, all of that together would educate the child. Now it's the state does it. And if you do anything else, you're kind of outside the norm. You're kind of crazy, you know, and that's ridiculous. For most of humanity, we've taught our own children and we developed all of this by that method. But now we want to abandon that. We want the, we want the state to raise our kids instead. All right. Let's, I want to shift gears a little bit here. Sure. Um, As much as I love that part of your story, this this uh, the second part of your story that I want to talk about. I'm in absolute love with because it's 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 amazing to me to hear when somebody comes from atheism to Christianity, and I'm just I I, I want to hear the story how that how that happened. How did you you know you started reading the Bible I guess, but how, what happened? Yeah, so um, to tell the story of how I went from atheism to Christianity, one needs to understand how I became an atheist in the first place. And I come from a a secular background. I wasn't raised in the church. I wasn't raised in religion. But at the same time, I remember being a very small child, maybe four years old, sitting in the grass uh, in the sunlight, thinking about God. And nobody introduced that thought to me. I just had it naturally where I was this child. I was sitting in nature, respectively, my front yard, but still nature. And thinking about God, 
without anybody ever having told me about this idea. So I think that I have had faith in the idea of God for a very, very long time. That's just been part of like my makeup. You know, like a lot of people, I had a single parent. So my upbringing was not as stable as it could have been. And I went through some struggles and I I was on my own a lot earlier than a lot of people. And when I was a teenager, I became pregnant and I ended up having that pregnancy terminated. And I think for me after that, I sort of needed to believe that there was no God because if there wasn't a God, then what I did was not the murder of a human being. And for, you know, a teenage kid trying to reconcile her reality without a lot of like support from community parents, and none of this is an excuse, it's just what happened. The way that my brain tried to reconcile the idea that what I did was somehow not that big of a deal was I sort of subscribed to this sort of atheistic thinking about the universe and, oh, well, you know, animals kill their young all the time. Like the thing, the things that I thought now when I look back on them seem insane to me, but it's embraced by the atheistic community that there, there is sort of like not really this like moral foundation that, you know, postmodernism, especially you see that like coming up in the culture. A lot of that has to do with the push from atheistic thinking that says there's no real morality. We kind of, we kind of made it up. And, oh, if you look at nature, they'll kill their young if they don't think that can support them and things like that. And at the time, as, as a young kid out on my own, I thought that was my only option. You know, I was in a foreign country. I was living effectively with strangers. I was running away from an abusive boyfriend and was scared to death. We fail our young women majorly in this regard, that when they do find themselves in, you know, circumstances like this, What seems like the normal option is to terminate your pregnancy. And the other options are, you know, you see this with these speeches that these women are giving in Hollywood. My abortion made things better for me. I was able to go on and win an Oscar. You're going to go on and, you know, have a high powered career as an attorney or whatever it is. But we're never allowed to tell women about what the other effects might be that you might have to deal with a lot of physical and mental trauma as a result of the decision that you made. So that happened with me. I was going through a great deal of guilt and physical trauma. I mean, I- I'm okay, but <laughs> you know, phys- physical and mental trauma, both in spades. And the way that I dealt with that was atheism. It made sense to me. Well, there must not be a God. You know, just it's just none of this would have happened. It- and I, you know, clearly I'm not a, a murderer. I don't even like to kill a kill a bug. If I, I, it's ridiculous to me. I don't kill a, I don't kill spiders, but it seemed like the only option to me to do this thing. And that's that's been a tough pill for me to swallow. It, like I was mentioning with people who go into the military, I don't think it's exactly the same thing because that's a more face to face experience that they have. But accepting that you did something horrible, that's hard to do, and it's not the easy path. It's much easier to say, no, 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 it's okay. And I have 15 million cognitive dissonance based reasons why one of them being there's no God. So I bought heavily into like pure science, you know, science-based thinking and um, not until well after the fact that I got away from sort of the crazy progressive leftism and had started opening up myself up to other people's thinking, was I actually able to listen to the ideas of people who were pro-life? And before I would listen to the ideas of people with pro-life and thought, oh, you just want to control women, you know? And I never put any stock in the things that they were saying that were based on an idea of objective morality, a morality that comes from God. And I realized, oh, my God, I've murdered someone. And with women who have had abortions, it's not as though you realize you've done this and then you can go to the police and say, I, I'm guilty. I've done this. Put me in handcuffs. I've done this. You just have to go on with the rest of your life. And it really kind of left me in a, in a oh, sort of a abyss, you know? And I, I think that 
having experienced those arguments, those pro-life arguments, and realizing what I did, it left me in a place where it was like, oh my God, I'm actually like a terrible, terrible human being. I deserve death. You know, like just self-hatred like you wouldn't believe. And so I had these experiences talking with people in the anarcho-Christian group, people who were making pro-life arguments that I was sort of starting to become friends with and talking to them. And someone had kind of just brought the idea to me that, you know, like, even though you do horrible things, God loves you anyway. You're a human being. He knows you've messed up. It doesn't mean that he doesn't still love you. And that idea hit me like an atomic bomb. I probably cried for a week straight that even though I had done this horrible thing that I could be forgiven. And so I was like, okay, I don't want to talk to people about how God wants me to understand him. I need to read the Bible for myself. And that's kind of where I don't necessarily get into like denominations and those like high level philosophical arguments that they have in the anarcho-Christian group. That stuff's above my pay grade. I'm just trying to, yeah, I'm just trying to understand what God wants me to understand. And God wasn't only talking to theologians with the Bible. He was talking to regular people like me too. And I went to the book, you know, with my sin. And I said, God, I have all this sin and it's weighing on me. What do I do with this? And I've at every page of the book of Matthew, of uh, the book of Mark and, and Luke has been as though it speaks directly to me. And, you know, Jesus talks about degrees of sin and how there is no specific degree of sin. Like he can forgive the person who steals a piece of candy. That's, you know, a person who's uh, done horrible things too. No matter what Same. you've done, no matter how absolutely horrible, when you realize it, you can be forgiven. God forgives you because God loves us more than we can possibly imagine. And he's able to do that through his son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that he made with his son. And that's, you know, bigger than me. That's more than I can understand. And when I was young and I didn't have any guidance and I hadn't had any exposure to God, I, I didn't understand any of this. And so I let myself be taken down such a dark path because I was trying to make my sin make sense to myself. And I can't do that. I can't make sense of my sin. I, I need God to do that. So that's where I am with that. And this is a, a new experience for me. Every day is kind of like a new revelation. Um, and the more I read in the Bible, the more I realize. And that, too, has improved my life by leaps and bounds. I, I attend church now. My, my husband is going with me. And it's been wonderful for our relationship. And I've been able to forgive myself, which is something that, like, God in the scripture, you know, says that if you don't forgive, you know, and, and yes, that's talking about other people, but that's talking about yourself, too. Like you need to forgive yourself because that's that's what God put the sacrifice of his son to take the sin, to take the burden of the sin. I've never heard it put like that. That's beautiful. I because because you're right, you do have to forgive yourself at some point. And you know, I, I think that mm -hmm. once you can forgive yourself, you know, I'm not you know, we're gonna we're gonna sin daily anyway, but once you can forgive yourself, it does take a weight off your shoulders. And I realized I don't have to go down these paths of thinking that are miserable and hateful, you know, and I don't have to hate all the people around me. And I don't, I don't even have to hate myself. That's been uh, new for me. <laughs> I, I've, I've hated myself since the day all of that happened. And I'm, I'm, I became ready for God to heal me. And, and he, he, I had that, that faith the size of a mustard seed. I think that I've had that since I was a child. And when my heart was fertile for it, then that plant grew. When I was ready and I accepted that I had done something terribly wrong, my heart became fertile and I, that seed was able to grow. And that didn't happen through me. I didn't will that. A lot of people who are my past atheist associations, they'll ask me like, what happened? Did you go through a drug addiction? Did, did someone you know die? Did you go to prison? Like they need for there to be like some horrible thing that kind of like forced me into God's arms. And it's like, no, um, my life is, before any of this started, my life is more stable and better than it's ever been. And maybe that quiet, 
that quiet period of my life gave me the opportunity to really think and calmly consider the actions of my life. And then, like I said, I think that at that point, my heart became fertile for the seed to grow. So here I am. This has been my sort of first time telling this story out loud. So <laughs> um, I hope that it made sense and wasn't rambling. That was great. I mean, I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us because that's an awesome story. Like I said, that's my favorite part of your story. But I, I actually had not heard that part, that story told, you know, I just knew that you had come from atheism to Christianity. Mm -hmm. But being able to hear the story is awesome because it's, I know it's pretty powerful stuff, man. You're, that's, that's, that's good stuff. We don't, um, we don't tell young women the truth about the negative effects of what can happen with their lives if they decide to have an abortion to terminate a pregnancy. The narrative that gets put out by, you know, the state and by Hollywood and pretty much everyone is that, you know, pregnancy will ruin your life. Right. And you know, an unplanned pregnancy saved the world. <laughs> so we we have a very poor uh, way that we deal with the fact that young women are going to end up pregnant. And the shame culture that surrounds motherhood needs to come to an end. That used to be something that was one of the most important and highly thought of things that you could do with your life was to be a mother. And we've created a culture now where it's like, no, uh, women should be out competing with men for, you know, top CEO. Okay, well, I'm not saying women should be forced back into the kitchen or anything like that. What I'm saying is we've gone so far in that direction that we've devalued the role of motherhood and it attached a stigma and shame to it. And I think that we could go a long way as Christians and as uh, liberty minded people to acknowledge that, you know, young, young people are going to screw up and they're going to do the wrong thing. Um, and some of them might get pregnant, but motherhood is not going to destroy your life. It's, it's actually a blessing. And that would be sort of the thing that I would wish to impart to younger women who might be listening to this is that, you know, if you end up in a, they used to call it end up in some circumstances. If you end up in some circumstances, think very carefully <laughs> about what you're doing because, you know, God has a plan. And all of us looking at the election of Donald Trump, for example, didn't realize that we were going to be forced out of our comfort zones and forced out of our avenues of thinking to end up having this conversation that we're having today. And I believe that if that's happening to us, it's happening to all kinds of people, that people are waking up and they're seeing things differently and challenging old ideas. and you know, that I have a very po positive outlook for the future. And that future, uh, you know, hopefully will include a lot of babies that come from unplanned pregnancies, because we're going to support the young women who have them. I like I like what you said about people waking up. I've, I've noticed it myself too, you know, because when I talk about voluntarism or, or anarchism with people, when you explain what it actually is and not what they portray it as on media or, for, or through government, people kind of are, are, are a little more receptive to it now, I think. It's still a little fearful for, for them, but I get messages, you know, private messages from people on Facebook. And, you know, because I used to talk about this a lot on my personal post and, or personal page, and I'm trying to get away from it, but I get messages from people thanking me for some of the stuff I'm saying, which is encouraging because. I get a lot of pushback. I get a lot more pushback than I do, you know, encouragement. So but I think more and more as, you, as we go along and people are starting to wake up to our awful situation, that they're going to be more receptive to it. Now, they not, may not go, you know, full-blown anarchism, but maybe they'll go more to a liberty-minded candidate if they want to vote, if they still feel the need to vote. Baby steps, you know, I think, you know, what we're trying to do with this project is just plant some seeds. And so many people are screaming right now that I think people are straining for the sound of a whisper that you everybody is 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 absolutely it's like chaos so if someone's making a little bit of sense that's going to attract more people than you think and I, I think that there are people who watch but don't comment there are way more of them than the people who are vociferously using their voice and so those people that are messaging you they're they're trying to let you know hey i don't i don't participate in all of this because it kind of scares me but I can hear the sound of the whisper over the screams. And that's important. That's awesome. 
I had Steven on not too long ago too. And he has a show on his episode. One of his episodes talks about the remnant. And I've talked to another friend of mine about the remnant. So, so whenever I'm talking to people, you know, if I'm debating somebody or we're going back and forth about politics, I'm not actually talking to them. If that makes sense. Cause I know that people are watching their people are paying attention to it. Those are the people I'm actually talking to because you're not going to change that person's mind that you're debating. That they're they're so dug in, they're doubling down like we talked about earlier. So once I realize that, you know, what I'm putting out, I'm trying not to be ugly. Sometimes I get ugly, but I'm trying not to be. So I'm just trying to put a message out there for the people that are watching, that are not voicing their opinion. And that's that's what we're trying to do with this as well. It's just plant some seeds, man, and just and, and hope for the best and see where, see where we go with it. It's Yeah, I think there can be some messaging problems when, um, for example, uh, I know you said that you weren't on Twitter, but I am on Twitter and there's like a whole anarcho Twitter community out there. And some of the way that the ideas are conveyed are uber aggressive. So if someone is a statist, you know, they could get dunked on or piled on by anarcho Twitter really easily. And although people are the ideas that they're essentially conveying are the correct ones, the way that they're conveying them is very aggressive. Well, you're just turning people off with that. They're not going to they're not going to be receptive to it if you're acting that way. And see, I was a statist when, for example, I was going around, you know, learning about libertarians and Mises caucus. I was still a statist at that point. And I talked to people who were unassuming, who didn't assume that because I had statist ideas that I was coming from a malicious place. And that's what I think we could all stand to do is realize that even if we disagree with some issues on some people, that they're probably essentially a decent person and they maybe have some misguided or confused ideas. But the way that we approach this person might make the difference. Not Maybe not even for that person. Like you said, sometimes you just know that the person you're talking to can't hear you. But if you convey your ideas well, that there are people watching and then they will be able to say, hey, this person made a lot more calm and reasonable sense than this person who was saying, well, you're just a racist. Well, you're just a sexist, you know, whatever the thing is. That's the best thing we can do for putting our ideas out there and hoping that they'll take hold is just to present them well. And to present them thoughtfully and not um, assumingly, you know, where you, when even when I'm talking to people who are socialist, I think socialist socialism is a absolutely horrific ideology when put into practice. But I know that the socialist person that I'm talking to believes that because they're coming from an essentially good place. So if I can make that person understand that we're both coming from a place where we we care, then you have a, a common ground, a, a platform upon which to build. And that's so important. And it's not done in today's society where you spend the time to actually build a platform with somebody that you don't agree with. And it's not necessarily about winning over that person. It's about putting that, that platform there for the next person who's quietly watching. They can stand on that platform and hop on to the next thing from there. But the more bridges we provide for people, the more these ideas will take hold. Exactly. And I feel like we could talk for hours about this. Yeah, this is fun. <laughs> so I want to let you get back to your family. And uh, I heard your dog barking when we were getting ready to set up. I'm sure he's waiting for you too. So yeah. go ahead and plug your, your podcast. Yeah, um, I right now I have a podcast called The Jessica Green Show. And I'm actually working um, with another network to develop a, another podcast where I actually have a co-host that's going to be called Postmodern Fallout. And the rollout for that is still a couple of weeks ahead. But I also have a blog. It's called The Libertarian Kitchen Witch, which is on WordPress. And that's mostly recipes. But, you know, I also talk about um, statelessness issues on there and stuff that kind of um, revolves around being a housewife, which I think is a career and deserves the kind of attention that any other field would get. So if you're interested in that, definitely check me out. And then um, if you want to contact me, I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Anarchy Toward, T-O-W-A-R-D Toward. And, you know, I'm a really open-minded person. So if you disagree with me, I want to hear from you. As long as we can have a respectful dialogue where we don't assume malicious intent about one another, I want to have a discussion, so please feel free to contact me anytime. Awesome. 
Awesome. Yes. Go check out her show. I've, I've, I've really been enjoying it. You're, you're fairly new to this too, I think. So yeah, I've got like five episodes, but I keep turning them out. So <laughs> that's awesome. All right, cool. Uh, I appreciate you taking some time to talk to me. This has been a lot of fun and I've really, yeah. really, really enjoy your story. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yes, ma'am. Uh, have a good day. You too. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. You can subscribe to the show wherever podcasts are found. And if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a rating as it is the best way to help other people find us. 100% of donations to the show are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about this week's guest and how you can support the show, please visit thebadroman.com. <laughs>